Um, so kicking things off, there are a bunch of topics to cover today. We've got quite a bit of time to cover them. Um, I'm going to slow it down as much as I can rather than getting super excited and talking over everybody um, and probably wedge in some time for some specific questions about your businesses, your specific security concerns and the things that I think uh, you might be here to, to discuss. There will be time for Ask a Hacker at the end. I absolutely recommend all kinds of security related questions that might pop in your mind, no matter how uh, esoteric or strange or even um, uh, funny they might be. Uh, this talk is definitely on the pragmatic side and not theoretical. Uh, I'm not specifically going to endorse products, but I might endorse specific strategies for ways to solve some of the problems of startups trying to establish themselves in a secure sort of a way. Um, and we also wanna focus much more on the real ways people get popped on the internet, the real ways you get hacked, the real ways you get exploited, as opposed to the you know marketing flash or pure hypotheticals. So there will be some swimming with sharks today. Two, uh, two big uh, takeaways for today. We're gonna do a little bit of basic threat modeling. The concept of threat modeling is basically to uh, think about the kinds of things you're protecting, like what specific kinds of assets do you think uh, attackers might wanna go after? Who are those people? What are the things they're going to want it to, uh, to go after? And then how would that attack really happen? Um, you could uh, come up with some obscure scenario in which you know, some angry nation state hackers fully funded with millions of PhDs and bajillions of dollars go after your startup, but it's not very realistic. So I think narrowing it down to the most likely, most pragmatic approaches is probably one of the best ways to threat model for a company in its early stages. And it could be that there just aren't significant resources at play or threats um, that will be going after your resources. So maybe you'll uh, sleep well at night thinking that you're not really going to be under attack. But some of these uh, slides may change your mind a little bit on that one. So first and foremost, who, uh, what are we protecting? What are the things we actually care about protecting from, uh, from attack or from any kind of uh, adverse operations or activities, hacker or otherwise? Fundamentally, all businesses have some concept of what the crown jewels are. Um, what that means is really what do you consider to be a business ending event and what data or uh, resources or information would put that those crown jewels at risk. Uh, prime example might be um, if you lost all of your customers um, uh, contact information, could you rebuild them in a, in a given day or you know, is there some um, asset or some file or some uh, control or access that if uh, if it was taken away from your company, you could never get it back or it would just be inordinately expensive to get things back on the rails. Um, does your business specifically rely on customer trust? If you are, for example, a security company and you prove to the entire internet that you're not worthy of people's trust, there are plenty of other security companies out there probably with similar uh, similar offerings. So it goes from we're playing sort of top of our game to nobody even answers our calls anymore in a fairly quick period of time. Um, there are exceptions to that rule. You can be too big to fail. Uh, Equifax is one I'd point to a little bit and say, like, there's a point at which you're too entrenched in the um, in the environment. There's too much uh, too much riding on the business relationships established. But for most startups and SMBs, that is not the case. You have to be much further along uh, in your journey as a company before you're in that uh, lucky or unlucky position. But the question for picking out what it is you're protecting is. How difficult would it be for your customers to leave? Um, are there other services or other startups that are doing similar things or companies doing similar things where the switching cost from your service or platform to someone else's is relatively low, which means you have to maintain that customer trust at the risk of losing the entire ship because all of your customers go elsewhere. Um, and then finally, on the assumption that a lot of the attack models we're talking about are going to be adversaries that you probably could identify or could predict, um, could your competitors eliminate you if they had this one piece of key data or knowledge or access or some secret that your business relies on in order to survive. That kind of gives the idea of what kinds of things are we protecting when we talk about security. Slicing and dicing critical data and assets, digging a little bit better or further into what those crown jewels might be. The first question would be, what kind of data are you carrying? Um, are you worried about your employees' personal information? Are you worried about customer personal information? Is there some corporate confidential data that you're worried about losing? Um, if you lost customer data, would they trust you ever again? If it was critical to their business, would they be able to recover um, if they were allowing you to protect their customer data? Um, we can talk more broadly about the general concept of, of intellectual property, uh, things like copyright or trademark or trade secrets that are assumed to be legally protected, but only if you file the paperwork the right way or protecting the right way. Um, in some cases, I've seen businesses who had a competitive advantage that was non-obvious, and then once it was revealed or once it was obvious to the competition, they effectively lost the ability to keep using it the way they did. So it's quite possible that your competitive advantages themselves, or even the analysis that describes your competitive advantages, may, the, may be the thing that you have to lose. 
Uh, top of mind for a lot of developers is going to be code. Um, what happens if my ent entire code base gets stolen? Um, could I survive that? Could I rewrite it if it was destroyed? Um, would I have to start over from scratch or do I have something I can recover in order to rebuild from some point along the journey as opposed to having to redo the whole thing? And in some cases, especially with more public companies um, with, with bigger PR reputation, the public relations cost of a breach can be too high for a company. Uh, loss of the brand can be incredibly important or loss of image. Um, and then finally, the financials of a company, especially when you're talking about you know, pre-IPO or pre-acquisition or before uh, private equity gets a good look at you, what your financials internally look like. Um, how clean they are or what the the sort of um, skeletons the closet might be could be the difference between whether or not you actually are able to successfully exit as a startup um, or whether or not you get acquired for a much, much cheaper rate because they found material weakness in, in what you've got to say. Uh, and then last but not least, um, if you have customers or if you have data you're carrying, like maybe it's credit cards or maybe it's uh, customer personally identifiable information or uh, customer data, there's a cost attached to the breach itself in order to make all of your customers whole. Um, that might be buying, for example, identity protection for everybody whose credit card got stolen, or it might be some attempt to uh, ward off a lawsuit because there was some improper handling of data. So the cost of breach itself can be enough to cause your business to fold if your business is small enough. So take a moment to think about what that critical data and assets looks like for your particular business. Finally, when we talk about you know what kinds of bad things can happen to your company, you need to at least enumerate or have a concept of what harms you're actually preventing. Um, if you break them down into... Um, sort of categories, all those things I was previously talking about, all those bad scenarios that might happen to you come into basically four buckets. Uh, the first is the classic breach scenario. It's loss of confidentiality, which means someone stole my secrets or my customer's secrets. And that's typically what people think about when they talk about you know, a breach or you know, ransomware or some, some attack that comes after them and, and renders them unable to continue doing business. Um, not always a business ending event, but very, very frequently. Um, second on the list, I would argue is actually scarier. And that's called loss of integrity, which means someone was in your data and has modified your data in a way that you cannot recover it. So your data was either lost or destroyed or worse yet tampered, and you can't trust it. Um, if you had five years of financials behind you and you found out one day that some hacker had been mucking around inside your financial systems and you've been you know, incorrectly reporting data to the market or incorrectly reporting data to investors or maybe even like your financials aren't as good as you thought they were because, because the, the data has been tampered with in the meantime, you now would have to go back and reanalyze or restate all those financials for five years. Like you'd be building a castle on sand at that point if you honestly couldn't trust something as critical as your own financials. So I think integrity is a key one in terms of losses that can become catastrophic relatively quickly. Third category is loss of availability. What that really means is um, someone shut down your website on purpose or someone shut down your service or shut down your capability. If you can't serve your customers, you don't really have a business. If they can continuously shut down uh, your services, people will probably go somewhere else. Uh, and then the last category, which we don't talk about quite as much, um, in the case where you have a large enough business with enough to lose, and especially when you have physical offices, there could also be loss of property or loss of life as one of the, the harms you're trying to prevent. That's usually much further along the business journey than the first couple stages of the startup. So first exercise for you all, and by the way, feel free to, uh, to dump some ideas into the, uh, the chat if you want to. Take a moment to write down or define for yourself what critical data or assets means to you or your business. I'll give it a probably 30 second break. The first question is, uh, take a moment to write down or define what are critical data or assets for you and your business? What are the things you're actually worried about losing? And then second on the list for this particular exercise, now that you have a concept of what your critical data or assets are, what kinds of bad actor personas, even just like cartoon characters of what it is you think the bad actor is going to look like, what kind of personas would be attracted to that data or attracted to those kinds of assets? Take a few moments. Do we have any volunteers to put forward what they think their critical data assets are? If not, I have one in my back pocket. I just figured I'd ask. I think we've got All a shy right. group today, Will. That's fine. Perfectly fine. All right. So just off the top, um, if I am, for example, um, ah, yes. 
a marketplace. Uh, I think it's Daria says, personal data like credit card info and addresses. Totally agree. Credit card info especially is one of those things where, especially with um, uh, regulatory regimes like PCI, so the Payment Cardholders Industry Association, um, credit card information is absolutely something attackers will go after. And if they have the full credit card uh, information, um, which is to say the full the full number, the expiration date, and preferably the zip code, they will absolutely bundle those and sell them on the black market. And your customers will be very rapidly trying to uh, burn their cards and get new cards issued. Um, if that's the type of breach scenario you're talking about, you're most likely looking at not just providing them with um, uh, some kind of remediation or identity insurance um, or protection plan, but also there'll be some amount of monetary payout to make them whole. So that can be a rather expensive form of a breach. Um, Thomas says, critical assets for us are customer data and their user data, 100% agree. I think that goes back to the trust question. Um, if you demonstrably can't protect their data from outside attacks or outside attackers, you're probably not gonna keep them as customers for very long. So I think that's a very critical asset to, to zero in on. Um, Brayden says, assets, uh, financials, code base, data loss and integrity, totally agree. I think we've covered a lot of those. I think there's also a question there in terms of um, your strategy for defending yourself. Is your code base in one place? Is it in a place that's accessible to bad actors like public GitHub, for example? Um, for your code base, do you have offline backups of these things so that if something happens to GitHub, for example, like they have a huge you know, database disruption and they dump all of their data and then they don't have the right backups to recover it and that sort of catastrophic case, do you feel comfortable that the things your business relies on, like the code base, um, you have a backup copy somewhere that you can use to uh, restore to normal operations in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, and then Mark says the customer database and the code base, 100% agree. Databases especially get targeted by attackers these days. They're sort of a, a sweet spot uh, to basically get access to a database server or get access to an application that's allowed to talk to a database server and then try to pull out literally everything there is in the database, either to ransom or to um, sell off to a competitor or otherwise to disrupt the business. In some cases, it might be uh, valuable enough just to dump the entire database. So basically use, use a, a full delete of the database um, in order to very visibly shock a, a company or, or impact the customers. Um, in the case of public companies, that can lead to like a pump and dump sort of a scam. Um, depending on how bad the incident is, the PR damage may be worse than the actual customer loss. So definitely good things to be aware of. Thank you guys very much for the feedback. As far as personas, do we have any concepts, or anybody willing to, to uh, drop in to the chat, um, any concept of who would be doing these things? Who are our bad actors and perpetrators? It's probably not just gonna be some, you know, 400 pound hacker in their basement with their like scary uh, V for Vendetta mask on hammering away the keyboard. It's gotta be something more to it than that. If we're talking financial motivation, by the way, looking at some of the uh, critical data you guys have pulled out, financial motivation tends to be professionals. Um, they may be not super sophisticated professionals, but professionals nonetheless. There are plenty of folks on the internet that are specifically aiming and targeting to get access to financials in order to co convert them or parlay them into something else. Uh, Braden says competition, absolutely, uh, especially if they know you exist. Uh, ransom hackers, yeah, that, I mean, so the, most of the ransom hackers are actually um, uh, Russian and Ukrainian organized crime war groups. Um, you have to be significant enough to get their attention or they have to scan the internet and find your resources already vulnerable for them to target you. Uh, they tend to go for very specific kinds of attack profiles. Um, in fact, at this point, they sort of have a truce where they're no longer targeting uh, hospitals, credit unions, or local utilities because it gets too much uh, government interest point in their direction. Uh, marketing firm that steals data. Absolutely. There is a whole lot of shady marketing firms out there, um, not just for SEO bombing, but other things that are willing to scrape information, you know, take, take whole copies of your websites and stand up like alternate versions of your product page somewhere else in hopes of getting paid, even offering things that don't exist. Uh, they'll take your money. They will absolutely not ship the goods. Uh, so your customers will be out, you know, some amount of money, maybe hundreds of dollars, and they'll be coming to your support line asking, you know, shaking their fists saying, why didn't you send me the thing I paid for? And you'll say, I have no record of you paying for this. So that absolutely does happen. Uh, Shivakar says, drive-by script kitties exploiting unpatched systems. Yes, absolutely that happens. Um, sadly, when it comes to those, those script kitties, so relatively less sophisticated attackers using scripts that downloaded from the internet, um, unfortunately, they tend to be effective because people do not generally do as great a, uh, a job as they think they do, keeping systems up to date and safe and secure, which is part of the reason why we're having this talk. But I totally agree. 
Thomas says people that want to disrupt operations and harm business reputation by attacking your uptime and breaching data, which makes customers not trust your business. 100% agree, especially in smaller businesses with many competitors. Um, holding someone else under a water so you can survive is unscrupulous, but not uncommon practice. Um, same is true, by the way, when it comes to uh, legal disputes like, you know, trademark or copyright or any situation where uh, you and a competitor fundamentally disagree on who did what first or who's allowed to, to access certain things. This, the wrinkle in that one's pretty interesting. Um, unscrupulous firms will hire unscrupulous lawyers who will turn to semi-professional hackers. And this is more common uh, in India than it is in the U.S., um, to break into the other law firm, steal the briefs or steal the proposals for what the, the case is going to look like and effectively neuter someone else's argument before they get to court. Uh, that happens surprisingly often in the last two or three years, much more than I would have expected if I wasn't watching the, uh, the data fly by. Great answers for great questions. Much appreciated. So focusing on you a little bit more and less of the generic, you know, what is critical data and who's coming after it? One of the big differences between traditional businesses like brick and mortar businesses and remote first SMBs is the structure of where, where people are and where the data lives. Uh, for example, if you're a remote first SMB and you don't have a corporate office more than maybe like a, a legally registered mailbox, there's no corporate office location for people to attack. They're not just gonna you know, kick in the door and then steal a bunch of file servers from the, the back room. It also means if you don't have a site, you don't have site firewalls. So the things that might keep your employee base separate from the internet and relatively protected don't exist anymore. Uh, there's this joke in security about m and theory, this idea that a lot of companies have a crunchy outer shell, but a soft gooey chocolatey inner, uh, inner core. When it comes to remote first SMBs, there's no crunchy outer shell. Every single asset all the way down to your cell phone can be targeted or can be attacked. They're not, they're not hiding behind a corporate firewall somewhere. So it's a little bit more of a concern um, to protect every single asset equally well, as opposed to just keeping all of your important things in one place. Looks like we have a question from Daria. Question ask, most startups do not have resources to hire a security expert within the first 10 hires. It would be nice if you could suggest resources for free cheap security checks, some literature courses for dummies, uh, and tools within DigitalOcean to secure the data for a startup. Um, I will provide some of those things. We can go into a little bit more of a discussion about some of the specific details. Um, I'm not going to make specific product recommendations, but I might, might make technology recommendations. Um, but we get into quite a, a, quite a bit of that a little bit further on. Um, but I 100% agree with you. It's extremely unlikely you're going to have a security person in your first 10 hires, uh, which I think I have a, an answer to a question further, uh, further into the talk about that. Um, the... The cutting to the chase on that one is the point at which you need to hire your first security person or even like part-time security person. Like, you know, if you have somebody who's doing half IT stuff and half security stuff is the point at which you have enough to lose that the cost uh, of, of that breach or the impact of that breach is enough to become a business ending event. Um, that will come at different times for different uh, organizations. Um, also, all businesses run on risk. If everyone could make a pile of money without taking risk, we'd all be doing it. We'd all be very rich, I'm sure. Um, so not hiring a security person in your first 10 hires is a rational security risk to take, depending on the shape of your business. If your business is inherently way more risky, for example, you know, I'm running a, a Bitcoin ATM company or I'm running like, um, you know, uh, a high finance, uh, fintech high finance investment company, and I've got hundreds of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that I'm, I'm carrying on a given day, you might want to hire that security person just a little bit earlier in your expected plan. Um, so every endpoint, uh, laptop and phone must be defended if there's no crunchy outer shell. Um, also, for remote first SMBs, all of your servers or services that you're building to run your business are probably exposed to the attacker on day one. Uh, it's a maybe hopefully well-known fact at this point that the entire IP4 internet, the traditional internet that we built way, way back before uh, IP6 came along, um, gets fully scanned every port, every host, every vulnerability four to six times a day. So the probability that you have a vulnerable system that you put on the internet and it doesn't get discovered by somebody within a day is pretty close to zero. Um, that might change the way you decide to deploy services. It might change your, your approach for how you roll out your, your website or how you roll out your database or how you roll out various systems and, and um, capabilities. Because if you assume that they're exposed to threat from day one, and furthermore, if you uh, assume that they will be exploited at some point, you plan a little bit differently. So step two of basic threat modeling, we have an idea of what we're protecting. Who are we actually protecting from? Who are these bad guys? Uh, we've mentioned a couple of these personas already. Um, professional criminals are by and large the, the uh, lion's share of the group. Um, you'll also see a ton of opportunists. Uh, if you're familiar with um, 
bug bounties and the idea that you know you're gonna put up um, maybe a five thousand dollar bounty to a group like um, maybe uh, Synac or Hacker One or Bug Crowd as the three rival competitors in the bug bounty field um, to be able to say if you find me a vulnerability and you present it to me first and don't tell anybody else under our NDA, then I'll pay you a reward based on bringing me that vulnerability that I didn't know about so I can pay the good guys to find it and then fix it before the bad guys find it. Um, the sad truth is there are a number of bug bounty reporters who are also just opportunistic extortionists. If they think they can make more money out of you by taking your data and ransoming it back to you instead of providing the bug, they may do that. They may also sell the bug to other people behind the scenes. It's not uncommon. Um, so if there's more value in getting access to your data than telling you where the bug is, maybe they change their hat. Maybe they go from a white hat to a black hat. Um, nation states absolutely do attack various parties on the internet. Um, prime examples, if you're reading the news, especially the Wall Street Journal, um, there's been a long running campaign for at least a decade um, by the Chinese government through um, sponsorship as well as uh, direct involvement to pursue intellectual property of various kinds. Um, same is true for North Korea on cryptocurrency theft. They have absolutely made an art out of cryptocurrency theft because they really love self-washing money. Um, but they have effectively fund their regime at this point by stealing cryptocurrency from others, washing it and trying to turn it into uh, usable money for them to evade sanctions from the US and the UN. Um, so nation states absolutely are active as the bad guys. Um, rogue employees, I think, um, people talk about it as a boogeyman much more than it actually happens. Uh, in order for an employee to decide to uh, rip you off directly, typically they already have to be significantly disgruntled. They have to have other motivations. There has to be some significant sense of um, um, being wrong that typically goes in that psychological profile, but it does happen. Um, direct competitors as well. We already talked a little bit about unscrupulous lawyers working for direct competitors. Um, if all it takes is you know fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to a hacking group from one law firm in order to get access to the other law firm's briefs, that is far far cheaper than losing the litigation. So they'll probably go for it uh, if they think there's a reasonable expectation they won't get caught. And that's sort of the big question. Um, and then last on the list, um, could I be a bad guy? I used to be. It's quite possible the people you work with, it's quite possible the consultants you bring in, it's quite possible um, people you interact with on a daily basis um, have at least at some level thought about it or contemplated it or debated in their own minds. Like, could I get away with it? Would I get caught? What would that look like? Um, I've just done it professionally before. Second exercise, uh, we talked about the bad guys a little bit. We have a concept of what kinds of personas we're playing against. Um, what's the attack path look like? How would an, uh, an attacker get access plausibly to your critical data via whichever um, attack path or model you're going for? What, is, what does a realistic attack path look like? For example, um, I'll just throw one out there. Um, you left your database misconfigured. It's hanging off the internet. The credentials are not very strong. Um, somebody started banging against your database. They threw the first 100,000 most common passwords against your database, and one of them got them logged in. And then they can now export all of your database, take your entire customer list or credit cards or whatnot, and walk out the door. That's one example. Take another maybe 30 seconds or so and uh, think to yourself what a typical or realistic attack path might look like. And when you're ready, dump a couple of those in the chat. Oh man, that's a great one. Ex-freelancers and ex-vendors who developed some pieces and had access to your core files could much later access some leftovers from their work and kill your site. Common in big platforms, absolutely agree. Um, totally agree, absolutely a realistic attack path really actually does happen today. Um, let me add one more wrinkle on top of that. It doesn't have to be your ex-freelancers or ex-vendors. You can have open source contributors upstream of you whose code you rely on that insert some kind of malicious code or even vulnerability into the code you rely on. You'll pull in some packages or pull in some particular code um, from some other project you rely on. Not notice that someone's made uh, an unauthorized or ill-advised modification to it. And then that code you just pulled in by updating all of your repos or updating all of your code base uh, with the latest and greatest of someone else's package ends up getting you popped. That has become much more of a big deal in the last two years. If you look at uh, Code Cove and um, 
what's the other company not too long ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I forget the name of them. Um, even Microsoft has, uh, has gotten themselves in a position where they accepted uh, patches or upstream code that they didn't necessarily fully review or trust. And it became the uh, relatively quick highway into their systems, their platforms, and their data. Anybody else have a realistic attack path? Nope. Vendor software, 100%. And I think, um, Braden, one of the problems with vendor software is, especially if it's closed source, you can't verify it, you can't test it, you're probably not gonna hire a professional reverse engineer to take it apart and prove to you that every last nook and cranny of that software um, is actually what it's supposed to be. If you look at reasonably large binary files, like the distributable for, let me just pick on somebody, Microsoft Word, for example, um, the binary itself on disk that runs the Word application is about 60 megabytes. 60 megabytes doesn't sound like much in terms of modern files, but in terms of a compiled binary, that is millions and millions and millions of lines of code. And the question then becomes, could you within reasonable amounts of time, or even is it worth the cost to you to audit that? To have someone go through it and make sure that the spicy parts and the scary parts are actually done correctly. And in all probability, no, you're going to rely on software that you know you can't prove or you know you can't necessarily trust. The question then becomes, what do you do about that? Do you stop using software you didn't write for yourself? Not realistic. Do you choose different kinds of software or different software companies based on your perception of trustworthiness? Probably. But like randomly downloading some application off the internet from somewhere site and assuming it's going to be healthy and, and safe and good is probably no longer in your in your um, risk of loop. Uh, bot scans, yep, that does happen. Competition hires hacker to poke holes at our system. That does happen, but there's got to be a very specific reason why they're paying money for it because hackers aren't cheap. Um, well, it's not entirely true. Most hackers aren't cheap. Some are quite cheap. Um, some will do it purely for the thrill factor. The only thing we have seen until today is brute force attacks on both our database and Redis clusters with random usernames and passwords and mitigated that by restricting outside access on our firewalls. 100% agree, 100% the right answer. Um, it's very common these days to use a technique called credential stuffing, where in addition to brute forcing and providing like random uh, usernames and random, um, random passwords to try to break into an internet exposed system, which by the way, probably shouldn't be internet exposed. Um, uh, the other thing people do is they'll look at recent password breaches, and there's almost a, a LinkedIn breach every six months these days, or it might be some, some other weaker site that you gave your credentials to that you don't necessarily trust as much, um, and looking at the password you provided, especially the plain text, and doing permutations of that password. So maybe it's your dog's name, and then it's your dog's name, one, two, three, and then it's your dog's name, exclamation point. Uh, you know, uh, Hunter one is the old joke from the, uh, the late 90s, but credential stuffing basically relies on you recycling your password or variations of your password on different websites. So, you know, note, note, note of NA, definitely don't um, share passwords across websites. Go, go for a decent password manager that generates them on the fly and makes them all unique and random because credential stuffing works surprisingly often when people only add one or two additional characters to their base password or they do permutation on the base password. Um, and for credential stuffing operations, especially targeting your email address, um, it usually takes significantly less tries than actual brute forcing. And if they can get into something like, you know, your recovery email address, they can typically go do password resets or account recoveries on every other um, account you've ever registered from that email. And then it's just, you know, off to the races, everything they want, anything they want. So something like your fitness app can end up getting your financial company compromised because you use too much of the shared common password or similar, similar enough passwords that credential stuffing actually worked. Great inputs, much, much appreciated. All right, third thing for basic threat modeling. How would that really happen? We've talked about it a little bit. I'm actually gonna go through, um, not, not probabilistically, but at least um, in terms of the most common stuff we'll see today, um, some of the major categories. And most of them won't surprise you, some of them might. For realistic attack scenarios for uh, SMBs, the most common one you're probably gonna see is business email compromise. What that means is someone got access to your email or somebody was social engineered into giving out an email password or someone uh, forwarded along a document they weren't supposed to, even just by pretexting and saying like, hey, I'm your vendor and you need to send me the latest bill, including the, the uh, financial information attached to account XYZ. Um, it's extremely common. Um, it's extremely easy to do, especially if you've got um, a company with uh, more lax security practices in terms of how fast and loose, you know, if every every founder in the uh, organization is allowed to pay bills or if the uh, the separation of duties is not very clean between who should or should not be doing certain things like, you know, paying off accounts or accessing banks, it's a lot easier to fool for, uh, fall for one of these um, pretexts or, or social engineering attempts 
to ask you to produce data or documents that people probably shouldn't have. So sometimes it's used to pull out specific financial documents or payment methods or bank account financials. Um, sometimes it's confidential trade secrets. Um, but all it takes to do business email compromise um, is a lookalike email domain that's close enough. So instead of like, you know, cloudcompany.com, I register cloudcompany.co and I have the names based on LinkedIn of the various people who work at that company. And I just, you know, set up a, an email account from cloudcompany.co uh, emailing you directly as uh, maybe one of your vendors with the name of the CEO or the name of somebody you already recognize uh, as working at that company. And next thing you know, you're willing to provide me the data I probably shouldn't have. So it's extremely typical. Um, similar but not the same, phishing typically is when the email delivers either malware or it delivers some kind of capability um, that gets them access to other systems. So typically what that means is in the case of SMS phishing, you know, convincing employees, um, usually via SMS, like, hey, this is your CEO. I'm at an offsite event. I need you to send me a bunch of Amazon gift cards right now. Um, if the pretext is good enough, uh, you don't need to access the account. You just got to convince an employee to do something on your behalf. The other thing that's typical is convincing employees to provide access to other systems inside your business. So, you know, convincing your assistant, for example, um, that you're from the IT help desk company and they have to install this one piece of software, this remote viewer software, so you can troubleshoot this problem that the CEO is complaining about. There's all kinds of interesting stories you can come up with there for reasons why the employee is convinced to install unknown or foreign software on a machine. Next thing you know, they've got access to your, you know, PayPal accounts, they've got access to your business financials or starting EFT uh, information out, or maybe they use that as the beachhead to get access into your database or other customer stuff. But um, in general, email is the most common compromise vector you're going to see, uh, whether it's straight business email compromise or phishing. Um, third on the list and very much first in the news uh, is ransomware. Ransomware is this concept uh, that if I can land a piece of malware, so malicious code uh, on your, your machine, it will then scour your hard drive, find all the files you care about, wrap them up with encryption with a key that only I as the bad guy know, ship the key off uh, to be able to ransom you and then pop a, a bubble on your, your screen or some notification that says, hey, I've got all your data uh, and you can have it all back if you send me you know, $500,000 in Bitcoin or equivalent, right? Um, the trick here is there are lots of ransomware authors who are not very good coders. Some of them will have an encryption function, but the decryption function doesn't work. So even if you pay them, it doesn't mean you get your data back. Um, some of them will actually take your money and then go out and sell the entire package of data because they can frequently exfil all of it off of the machine to any number of other customers or competitors. There are plenty of cases where you'll see large troves of a company's data floating around uh, the darknet forums uh, looking for a buyer. Someone's like, hey, I've got you know n number of megabytes or gigabytes of files from company X who wants it. I'll sell it for you know 20,000 USD equivalent of Bitcoin or something like that. Um, so this is one of those cases where one, you'd like to prevent the ransomware from happening in the first place. But two, if you can't prevent the ransomware from happening or landing on the machine, then your backup strategy becomes absolutely crucial. If you can fully restore what you had on the machine before it got hit, you can now evaluate all the files that were lost and say, if this gets you know, dumped into the public, what's the risk exposure? What am I actually losing here? What's the, what's the scare factor? Um, if you get it all wiped out or if the encryption key doesn't work correctly, you can now restore all of your backups on top of your previous system and have a reasonably high chance or a probability that even though you got ransomed, it didn't really impact your, your business in quite the way it could have. So um, very flashy in the news. Everybody's familiar with the uh, Colonial Pipeline ransomware from about two years ago. These can be very significantly impacting and for companies with pretty good defense too. Uh, the idea being, I need to land one piece of ransomware on one customer machine one time, and then I can use like internal reconnaissance to find the machines I care about with the data. And from there, I can basically lock up your entire business. Um, I think Colonial Pipeline was down for, I want to say, three or four weeks in total and could not ship gas across the U.S. East Coast uh, during their ransomware incident. Um, there's some debate about whether or not that was self-imposed, like they chose not to restore as quickly as they could because they wanted to have a better idea of how the whole thing went down. I'm not opposed to that idea but the impact can be pretty significant. Thomas says, having backups not only saves the production environments, it has saved our development environment too. Mistakes happen, we are humans after all, 100% agree. Uh, have you ever accidentally dropped the database table? I definitely have, and it definitely cost me something. So 100% on that same page. I think backups are those things that people may put off until like a more convenient time. But in the earliest phases, having good discipline or good hygiene about access or good discipline about you know, when you back up and how, how often, testing your backups and making sure your restores actually work correctly, super critical to make sure you don't have a huge, huge data loss event. Totally agree. Um, fourth on the list for realistic attack scenarios, 
loss of personally identifiable information or customer data. Um, this is probably more common than you think it is, but not in the way you think it is. Um, I can probably count on both hands and maybe a foot the number of companies I've worked for where someone just left a laptop with an unencrypted hard drive in a cab or a hotel or an airline seat and been unable to recover it. Someone's going to pick up that laptop. Maybe they just want to sell it. Maybe they can't access it because you've got good encryption on the, uh, the machine and therefore it's just a piece of metal to them. But the idea that all of your customer information or even your backups or your code base just walked out the door because someone left the laptop in a cab, not a great scenario, not, not a good time. Um, even more scary, if it was, for example, a person identifiable information um, and the number of customers for, say, the EU was significant, say more than about 10 you may end up having to file like a disclosure to the European Data Commission saying, we left the laptop in a car. Oops, what do we do with this? Um, not a comfortable thing. Those are usually uh, public reports or at least partially public reports. So um, it ends up being a bad look, but it does happen all the time. This is one of those cases where having fully encrypted laptops or having fully encrypted um, thumb drives when you're, when you're transiting data between sites or locations is super useful because you can say, yeah, we don't have it, but it was encrypted and the key wasn't on the device. So even if they have the device, they can't access the data. Um, finally, you've got your rogue employee scenario, opportunistic threat. Um, more than once I have seen a laptop left in the back of an employee's car in a bad neighborhood. And then one smashed window later, we have to report a breach, effectively saying somebody stole it because it was just within you know, eyesight of them. Um, I think the most recent one I had might have been an employee of ours in like Atlanta, Georgia, where it just, you know, right, right car, right neighborhood, right time, and suddenly the thing is gone. So it's an uncomfortable scenario to be in, but it absolutely does happen. It has to be considered in terms of like data loss scenarios and reportability. Uh, Darius says, general question for later, droplets in digital ocean, each additionally protected within the team. Is it more difficult to hack a platform that is situated on separate platforms, database droplet, core files droplet, transaction, et cetera, or is it more secure to use various providers for various pieces of info? Same for backups, should they be done uh, on a different droplet or different provider? Um, I'll give you the short version of that now, and then the longer version if you're still hanging around later. Um, you generally want to separate your risks or concerns into separate domains. If possible, you want to take anything that could be uh, compromised, like a given account or a given resource, and split it out. So, for example, if I had my primary um, operational environment on DigitalOcean, I might have my backup shipping to AWS. And maybe I'll just pay a little bit to AWS just to keep my backups offline, but I want them to be completely separate and a completely different um, protection regime for my primary. I also don't want to have credentials or API keys inside my DigitalOcean environment to perform that backup job that then could allow that data to be pulled back out again. Because in that case, compromise of one is compromisable. So you want to have slightly different um, approaches or maybe orthogonal detections in some cases so that it's less likely the compromise of one is compromisable. I can do more on that later. Second set of realistic attack scenarios, um, and these are things that, that probably will occur more to developers um, or people that are in specific um, industries than others, uh, but they probably apply more generally to all SMBs. Um, if you're building anything useful on the internet, you're going to have systems that talk to each other. You're going to have services that talk to each other. Maybe you've just got uh, an application server that talks to a database server. In order to access each other's data, you have to store credentials or some kind of keying materials like API keys on those machines. Um, the loss of those credentials or keying materials, even something as silly as like, hey, I you know, accidentally uploaded our API key into um, uh, GitHub, for example, um, or GitLab. The loss of those credentials can become catastrophic if they're not scoped down to the minimum amount of access they need, if that's the one API key that gets you access to every single server or every single database or every single service, then compromise of one is compromise of all, right? Your, your risk domain is, is too intermingled, it's too pooled together, and therefore um, you end up in a, a catastrophic scenario fairly quickly. If you break those up into different problem domains, like read-only keys versus read-write keys, or if this server can only access that database and nobody else can access that database, if there are multiple layers uh, of um, security controls wrapped on top of them, then compromise of one doesn't have to be compromise of all. Um, but realistically, um, if I have access to your credentials from uh, grabbing maybe your API keys for Amazon or DigitalOcean or other places um, off of your GitHub repo, um, I can probably spin up a huge number of resources and leave you with a bill. I can probably shut down your entire environment. I might even be able to delete your entire environment. Um, if it gives, if access to your account gives me access to your data, uh, then I can generally do data theft at scale. So that full SQL dump scenario we were talking about a little bit earlier. But very interesting and very relevant question. Um, 
Last two, uh, intentional thrift, thrift uh, I cannot word today. Intentional theft of cryptocurrency is more common than we would think it was, uh, largely because there are organizations, especially crime art groups in the North Korea, um, that have effectively targeted crypto companies and companies doing anything cryptocurrency related because whether you have good practice or bad practice, the amount of resources they get out of a successful heist is relatively high. The ability to hide the data, wash the data, or pull the data out as actual cash is relatively high for at least most of these that have well-established like uh, coin tumbling networks. So theft of cryptocurrency is a much bigger deal now than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Finally, one more thing to think about if you're selling or, um, or have anything that's, that's uh, user controlled in terms of services. Abuse, fraud, and theft of services are extremely common. They happen all day, every day. Um, one of the preferred techniques for a bunch of the uh, Russian attacker groups, especially the nation state groups, is not to buy their own infrastructure, virtual machines, et cetera, but to steal someone else's. Once they have access to your resources, maybe they'll use it for a phishing site. Maybe they'll send email or spam out of it. Maybe they'll use it to lure someone else into some kind of um, uh, compromising scenario. But the idea is in order to understand how your services capabilities can be used against you or used against others, you basically need to write yourself a little user story. And it's not the typical as a blank, I need blank so I can blank. It's a malicious user story. So it might be as a spammer, I need access to your mail server so I can send hundreds of millions of, uh, of pieces of spam and get paid pennies on the dollar. Or it might be um, as a fisher, I need access to your web server so I can set up a fake Microsoft or Amazon or Azure site so I can email a bunch of people and build them out of their accounts and therefore steal all their money. But these are used as methods by which your infrastructure or your services can be parlayed into some other monetary value. So theft, fraud, abuse of services. All right. So back to you. What's actually different about remote first SMBs? Um, I've referred to it a couple of times as the Starbucks uh, threat model, which is to say, pretend all of your employees are working out of a Starbucks for eight hours a day. You cannot trust the Wi-Fi. You cannot trust the infrastructure, the uh, endpoint itself. So the phone or the tablet or the laptop becomes the perimeter and therefore has to be defended as if it has a firewall around it. Um, basically, nothing can be trusted that threat model. Um, for remote first SMBs, also all of that production data and services will e either live in a co-location center or they're going to live in a cloud. Um, so what does internal really mean? Internal systems need to be protected, have to be behind a firewall, they have to be behind a VPN, have to be behind uh, some kind of system that can keep the uh, the bad guys from knocking at the door. Um, there will be a constant barrage of attacks. I highly recommend logging them to see where the attacks are coming from and what kinds of attacks are being thrown at you. But at some point, you'll misconfigure something. At some point, you'll leave a database online. At some point, you'll leave some service with some silly credentials in it that probably shouldn't be there. So you have to assume from day one that your assets can and probably will be compromised. So start thinking about what your, your solution is for when that day comes better to be prepared for it and not need that plan than for the uh, eventuality to happen and then you don't have a plan. Much, much worse day. And then one more for remote first SMBs, because we don't have the corporate site, we probably don't have the same kinds of uh, insider threat detection capability or software we might typically run. So insider threat becomes much harder to detect. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know that your employees are who they say they are? How do you know that your, your partners are actually vetted? We talked about the idea of a third party supplier that shows up as, you know, uh, trustedcompany.co instead of trustedcompany.com, there's quite a bit more validation required to say that who you're dealing with is who you think uh, you're dealing with. There are also ways you can verify them. Things like, you know, when you set up an initial bank account, ask someone to do uh, a couple of small payments to verify that they own and control that account. Uh, and then verify that against maybe um, the well-listed uh, business address for that particular location or call someone on the phone in addition to getting their email to verify that they actually are who they say they are and they're not somebody posing as somebody else. Finally, and this has become much more of a, a big deal since uh, COVID took off, um, there's a rash of people showing up and interviewing for positions um, who are very successfully getting through the interview. And the person who shows up to actually take the job is someone completely different. So how do you know who you actually hire, right? So there's some ability to do background checks in a lot of countries, not all countries, but it's become pretty popular at this point um, for folks to show up for jobs they're not qualified for in hopes that they can just kind of like eek by or like learn on the job in order to do it. So if you get the impression that the person that showed up for the job isn't the person you think you hired, um, the best solutions in general, besides a background check, come down to re-interviewing them with the parts of their resume that they should easily be able to explain or justify their experience. Also, highly recommend a video calls for these and just saying like, hey, you know, during the initial interview and especially during a second stage interview, like get to see them, get to look look at their face and understand what they, they look like. And then when the person that shows up for that first day of work um, isn't that person or you're not sure they're that person, be a little bit more suspicious. Um, sadly, this is uh, much more significant um, 
in the APAC region of the world, but it's pretty much global at this point too. I've had uh, a hire in the past mm, probably two years or so um, that very much was this inside one of my security teams. So things to be aware of. All right, um, I'm gonna stop for questions here before we jump into the second phase, which is much shorter, uh, which is about pragmatic solutions. Questions uh, in the chat for anybody that had anything uh, that wasn't clear in the previous stuff. Nope. All right, pushing forward. Um, so we've talked about threat modeling. We've talked about what kinds of things we're, we're protecting from who and what those realistic attack scenarios might look like. Let's talk about what SMBs need in order to protect themselves. Um, one of the first things you can do at any phase of business is start practicing your incident response plan. Have an idea of how you're going to respond to an incident when it does happen. Um, second on the list, pick an ecosystem. Um, don't host your own whatever. Third, lock down your endpoints as best you can. Yes, that can be expensive. I'll go into more detail shortly. Um, Fourth, start your business off with strong practice, like strong authentication. Um, vet your employees as best you can. We talked about a little bit. Assume your infrastructure is under attack, we talked about. And then start paying the good guys to find your weak spots. Going a little bit deeper. Um, the fundamental structure of an incident response plan, um, according to almost any security, security dude you'll talk to, comes in about six steps. First is to be prepared for it, which is to say have an incident response plan and maybe practice it ahead of time. Have an idea of who's authorized to activate it, who's authorized to make calls on behalf of your, your business. Um, if your services go down or if your servers go down, who's authorized to, to turn them back on? Who's authorized to say, don't turn them back on because we have to collect some evidence. Um, when an incident first pops up, you're in the identification step, so identify. Um, once you identify the nature of the uh, assumed compromise, so let's say confidentiality, integrity, or availability, um, you need to confirm that with either a second source or some kind of logs or some kind of evidence. So it goes from, I think a bad thing happened to we have confident evidence that a bad thing happened. Your third step is probably the most critical. Contain the access or contain the resources down to um, whatever accounts need to be locked, whatever systems need to be shut down, whatever um, is necessary in order to stop the bleeding and verify that the bad actor can go no further. Once you think you're adequately contained and the, uh, the bleeding is stopped, your next phase is to eradicate the threat that might be removing malware, it might be you know, destroying accounts, it might be getting rid of or maybe reformatting um, uh, machines that were impacted that you can't trust anymore. But the eradication step is effectively, once you're fully contained, and especially after you've collected your logs or forensic information, get rid of the bad thing. Fifth on the list is the restore step. That's basically returning to normal operations, get everything back to where it should be after the incident is done. And then the sixth and frequently forgotten step is the lessons learned step. What detection or prevention or identification or response steps could I add to my playbook or to my incident response plan so that if we go through the scenario a second time, it either can't happen again or it's more obvious I have better visibility, better logging, better understanding of the things that happened in order to make it easier and smoother for you to go through that same incident a second time in a row. So that's the basic structure of uh, the incident response plan. The acronym PICAROL gets used. So prepare, identify, contain, eradicate, restore, and lessons learned. Um, that's fundamentally the six steps in a nutshell. Practicing is a little bit different from just talking about it. So you're going to want to go through with your team and understand in this phase, with this hypothetical scenario, like a business email compromise or a ransomware scenario, how would we respond to this? What tools do we have? Are they good enough? Do we need process for this? Or can we sort of make it up as we go for some kinds of scenario? And as usual with complex things, there's a couple of gotchas. The most common mistake I see in instant response plans typically is what's called rush to restore. Before you fully identified your threat, before you fully scoped what happened or how it happened, before you've collected any of your evidence, the uh, business tries to rush to get things back online. What typically happens as a result of that is you end up turning on systems or re-enabling uh, re access when the bad guy is still in there or still has the ability to get in there. So the net effect ends up being, as soon as you open up the door again, they're right back to the race. They're siphoning off more data or they're destroying more files whatever the case is. So if you're not 100% clear on what happened to compromise your systems or what happened in order for your data to go out the door and why it cannot happen again, then you're not really ready to restore, which is why those six steps are, are sequential. The way you actually get there frequently, and this is uh, in the identification step early on, is the more logging you have, the more traceability you have, the more visibility you have, and the more your risk is limited into small little risk pockets, the easier it is to run an incident response plan, and the more comfortable you're going to be with the idea that you know that the bad guy got kicked out and they can't get back in again. But if you don't have that logging, tracing, visibility, or if your risk is all commingled, it's all the same API key, or it's all the same couple of accounts and not broken up into logical chunks that shouldn't access each other, 
then you don't necessarily have a good way to say that the, the job is done, that the, uh, the bad guy is effectively kicked out. Um, a great analogy for this in terms of risk limiting is the idea of like a gas station cash drawer. You only need to keep enough cash in the drawer for one day's operational business. If you need to call in and get more because somebody uh, somebody came in with a hot lottery ticket or something, you can call for backup and have additional cash delivered. But the amount of cash in the drawer at a gas station should represent the amount of uh, cash that's gonna change hands in a given day. And therefore the limit on the amount of damage that can be done to the business is only the amount of cash that's gonna be in that drawer for one day. Seems kind of obvious, but there's a lot of people designing systems, especially complex systems. They don't think about it in terms of how much risk do I want to put in this one place this one time. They think about it in terms of what's the efficient way to manage all my risk all at the same time. Third gotcha, um, and it shouldn't surprise us probably, um, with every incident comes some amount of public relations work or some crisis communications work or some amount of uh, mandatory disclosures, especially in places with specifically strict uh, privacy laws. California, I'm looking at you. So knowing your customers, knowing your customers jurisdictions and knowing where the data was and where the customers are will tell you fairly quickly, who do I have to inform? Do I need to notify the attorneys general of all 50 states, for example? Do I have to make a report to the EU? Is there some other uh, data privacy or disclosure route that needs to be pursued? So the more you understand your customers and where your risk is, the easier that conversation becomes, even before the lawyers get involved. All right, that's enough for incident response plans. Um, pragmatic solutions, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. When I say pick an ecosystem instead of hosting your own whatever, what I really mean is if you're starting up your business, you don't want to have to run your own, administer your own email server, unless that's your primary business. You don't want to have to build your own website. You can start with some other, you know, fundamental starting point. Um, most folks will go with Office 365 or G Suite initially as their ecosystem and use whatever's convenient in there. You do get a lot of value and a lot of mileage out of it. The other thing to recognize is you get a lot of security built in for free, especially stuff like you know advanced security tools that you can either pay for additional add-ons or you can enable later on when you're ready to actually handle them. But if you think you're going to build everything in the 1996 version of the internet where you have to run one of all of these things, I got to build my own chat server, build my own mail server, build my own you know website, got to build my own database from scratch. You're going to spend a lot more time not doing the thing that makes your business successful and spin your wheels quite a bit. You're probably much better off going with an ecosystem that's well-established and well-trusted. Not to say I'm going to go pick some, you know, random fly by night thing, but it's going to be one of the big two or three or four that we all recognize and say, like, nobody really rejects email from Gmail, right? Or Outlook.com, right? It's not really a thing I have to troubleshoot. So I shouldn't waste my time on that. That's not my unfair business proposition that makes me successful as an SMB. So I'm not going to go down that route. Second up, um, we talk about it a little bit, but the idea that um, if every single endpoint, so a phone or a laptop or a server is its own perimeter has to be defended, you have to make some pretty early decisions about what's good enough. How do you do mobile device management? Do you have the ability to remotely wipe a machine if someone steals it? Um, device trust, can I be sure you're coming from a corporate asset? Can I be sure that your system is up to date and it's patched? Antivirus is usually not enough. Um, it's really expensive, but endpoint detection response is far, far better. But I think you're much further along your journey in security before you get to that point. I guess the, the answer here for locking down your endpoints is, follow the best practice you're aware of. Maybe you don't spend huge amounts of money on it, but leave yourself some runway to go down that path in the future. Because when you need it, you want to have not painted yourself into a corner. Um, when I say start your business off with strong authentication, what I really mean is, um, SMS is basically untrustworthy these days. Push notifications are similar. It's relatively easy to uh, duplicate um, a cell phone number or MZ or IMA. Uh, it's not difficult to get those, those things uh, up and running. So if you're really going to go for strong authentication at the beginning, instead of using passwords at all, use password managers. You can pick your own. LastPass had a breach in the past year or so, so I probably wouldn't go with them. But in general, there are a bunch of strong password managers that will guarantee that every password you generate is unique and distinct and long and strong enough to be uh, used anywhere. The other big one, and this is something that uh, has been foiling a lot of phishing attacks lately, they're not always this cute, but UB keys or physical hardware tokens, it doesn't have to be UBCO as a company, it could be any of them, where you have to physically touch the device in order to provide the password that gets you access to your critical systems. It's absolutely phenomenal in terms of preventing normal phishing, normal SMS fraud, normal push notification fraud, all the stuff that gets um, critical systems popped. If you can only log into your critical systems with a physical hardware token that's physically in your possession, um, I've got four or five around here, I forget where they are, um, that is tremendous. The other thing to acknowledge with physical keys is you can't ever have just one. You have to have at least two, right? You've got your primary key you use all day, every day, and you have a backup key in case you lose it. If you have just one and you drop it in front of your car and the car crushes it, there goes your access, right? There, 
effectively what you need is multiple strong tokens or physical tokens, especially to be able to say for the critical access that only you should have or only certain people you trust should have, um, the absolute best you're gonna get is multiple physical tokens. So at least one primary and one back. Um, vetting your employees is painful. We talked about background checks. We talked about references. We talked about video calls to verify people are who they say they are. This is a relatively unsolved problem post COVID. There's not really a great way in some jurisdictions to get a clean background check. Um, so there's a lot of how much risk do you wanna take on and do you trust the people in front of you? A lot of it's just a judgment call, unfortunately. Uh, we talked a little bit about assuming your infrastructure is under attack. The general rule for this, for uh, remote first SMBs is if a service is not directly serving customers, but doesn't have to be accessed from the internet by your customers to do something business critical, it should be hiding behind a VPN or a firewall. Anything that could be misconfigured or maybe not, not entirely as tightened down, maybe you just didn't have time to do it the right way and you come back and do it next Tuesday. Anything like that shouldn't be sitting on the internet. It should be VPC or VPN off from the internet behind some kind of firewall so you can say at least the bad guys can't constantly knock on the door by throwing brute force or um, uh, any number of attacks at your uh, your source uh, resources until they finally find their way in. Um, fun fact for brute forcing, uh, there is a very famous password list. I think it's seven or eight million passwords long. It's called the Rocky list. It was designed probably 10 or 15 years ago. It is the speed optimized list of most common passwords found in a breach for the past 25 years worth of breaches. So hypothetically, this is the, the most likely, the least likely password to get you into a particular account. Um, those speed optimized lists plus fairly aggressive uh, brute forcing farms and some really cool uh, optimizations in hardware mean there are brute force farms um, on the internet that can easily crack 6 million, 7 million passwords a day and are just constantly looking for um, various things on the internet to try. And their success rate is pretty good. If you just spin up uh, a droplet or a virtual machine anywhere with the root user and a really weak password, you know, password one, two, three or something, you can pretty well time it. Uh, and I'm reasonably confident you'll get popped in the first five or six hours um, on the long side. Frequently, it's faster than that. Um, usually, those machines will get turned into DDoS hosts. They'll be used to attack other people or they'll be turned into um, spam machines. But the speed at which those unprotected machines are attacked and compromised the internet with bad passwords is remarkable. Uh, finally, for the list of pragmatic takeaways or pragmatic solutions, there will come a point, even before you hire your first security person, where you have to start paying the good guys to act like bad guys. What that means is bring in people who understand the hardcore security stuff a little better than you do in order to verify your designs or your results, make sure that it's accurate and good, make sure that the good guys get to it before the bad guys do. So that might be paying a penetration tester to find something before a malicious outsider. It might be bug bounty programs, which I think generally are pretty useful, even on a limited budget. Um, or it might be something like software security consultants who will at least be able to walk through just how you handle cryptography or maybe how you handled secret storage or maybe it's access control. But the security critical aspects of your system or your business you're worried about, you probably want to spend a little bit of money to get a strong security consultant in there to, to kick the tires some more and say, I don't see any obvious flaws or implementation or this looks clean to me. Um, the reason why that's so critical is if you don't have that expertise, you may think you're safe for a very long time and then find out the hard way that you're not. And the cost of breach for something that's a security critical component tends to be pretty high. And it tends to be all of your data as opposed to some of your data. So that's the place I'd look at it and say, I was going to hire a software security consultant specifically to look at one thing. It would be those critical junctures where I'm handling cryptography or secrets or access control or maybe data security. And that pretty well wraps up our pragmatic solutions. Um, final things to close out on before we just throw it up to uh, an open Q&A. Uh, answer the question, when will I need a security team? It's still going to be whenever you have enough to lose. If your business carries, you know, $20,000 in cash and you could easily replace it by, you know, running through your couch cushions, maybe. Let's pretend I'm rich. Um, maybe you don't have enough to lose and it's not a big deal. If you're doing significant financial transactions, if you've got huge amounts of resources or data or credit cards you're carrying, the point at which that keeps you up at night is the point at which you should at least hire a part-time security person to start helping you structure your, your business in such a way that you're more defensible or at least you have a better chance of surviving that breach scenario. What constitutes a business ending event? We've talked about this before. Anything you cannot recover from as a company or are unlikely to recover from without extreme costs, probably a business ending event. Those are the things you'd be focusing on first to make sure those are the first risks you try to pay down. Um, third, what is cyber insurance and do I need it? Uh, for SMBs, um, probably not yet. Uh, it, 
first off, cyber insurance uh, infrequently pays out. There's a whole lot of gotchas involved in it. If you read the way it's uh, written, typically what happens is you'll use your best practice and then the cyber insurance company will bring in their forensic examiner and find all the ways in which you work following best practice. And they may find an excuse to not pay out the, uh, the insurance. If they do happen to pay out, it's gotten really, really expensive over the past two or three years because of ransomware to even get those policies. So it may not be net positive for you, even if you do get breached. So caveat emptor. Uh, and then finally, you know, what about security product X, Y, or Z? Um, my warning, having done security for 20, 25 years, is there's a whole lot of snake oil in the security market. If someone's making claims that seem too good to be true, absolutely play test every piece of it and verify the thing they claim they're giving you is the thing you're actually getting. Because in a lot of cases, it's not. That pretty well covers the must. We did talk about base threat modeling. We talked about who, uh, what we're protecting. Who we're protecting it from. We talked about pragmatic attack scenarios and how that stuff would really happen in, in real life. Um, we talked about pragmatic solutions, uh, including incident response plans, ecosystems, securing your endpoints, strong authentication, vetting your employees, uh, assuming infrastructure under attack, and then hiring the good guys to get there before the bad guys do. What are the questions from the crowd? Barry says, enough to lose applies for any startup in the very beginning if you're working with personal data in Europe. 100% agree, 100% agree. If personal data leakage is your fault, prepare to close your startup uh, if going to court. I am wondering which steps to take on DigitalOcean with the lowest cost possible. Um, so that's a very large question with a lot of, lot of answers. I think the, the big concern in general is going to be um, have you done your due diligence in terms of hardening your systems, isolating your information, isolating your threats in such a way that you're not carrying more risk than you have to? Prime example would be, um, if it is personal information, can it be encrypted? Can it be row encrypted in the database? Can it be wrapped up in such a way that, you know, you have multiple databases, maybe the EU versus the non-EU database where compromise of one is not necessarily compromised of the other. Along the same lines, if you're taking something like credit cards, you don't have to store the credit cards yourself. You can just tokenize a credit card to the company. Like, again, maybe I'll pick on Stripe for a hot minute. You can keep a copy of their reference to the credit card, which cannot be used to charge a card. Instead of having, trying to save that credit card back into your database, which if somebody accesses it, they can now use that credit card for bad things. So risk limiting in terms of making sure you have as little data as possible, as little, as little PII as possible, and also making sure the risk that you do have, you're accounting for, and you're protecting in a reasonable sort of a way, especially by separating your risks from each other uh, and having tight controls on who can access what will do a whole lot of good. There's not a grand strategy I can point you to. There are a bunch of uh, bunch of websites and books I could uh, I could toss you away in terms of how to think about data security, but it's a very very large topic. Is there a follow-on? Yep, go ahead. We'll give everybody just about a minute um, left to put in any remaining questions in the chat. Come on, ask a hack or anything. If you could provide any entry level resource as a list, that'd be uh, very appreciated. I will say, yeah, it is a long list. Um, we've done a pretty decent job at DigitalOcean of updating our security blog, not just with you know incidents or vulnerabilities or stuff like that, but also a bunch of um, blog posts specifically on how to secure your droplets, how to secure your systems, how to secure your account. There's a bunch of blog posts I'd point you to that we're trying to do a little bit more uh, and get the name out there a little bit more on the security side of the house, but there's quite a bit of how to secure yourself um, content already on our, um, our uh, wow, what's it called, uh, trust platform, uh, which is just a sub, sub portion of the main website. All right, one more just for fun. Um, as of about eight years ago, nearly all passwords of eight characters length any number of you know, letters, numbers, special characters, et cetera. Um, those have all been computed um, forwards and backwards in the major hashing algorithms, like you know, your MD5s and your you know, SHA-1s. So if you're using a password of less than about 10 or 14 characters, maybe, you're probably putting yourself at an unnecessary level of risk. My recommendation would be 
one password managers, but if you happen to be using on your personal Gmail account or I don't know, AOL Instant Messenger, whatever it happens to be, a password shorter than about 10 characters long, consider changing it. Cool. If that's it for questions, thank you very much for your time and attention. Much appreciate the back and forth, especially some of the uh, scenarios you guys have put forward as far as realistic attack and what kinds of data you're trying to protect. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Will. And um, if there are any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to either our team at One Valley or um, Will at DigitalOcean. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon.